Um, well, hi everyone, welcome to ArtsFest Online and to this afternoon's Hoping webinar, Illustrating Industry. Presentations will be from Ruth Hibbard, Deborah Sutherland and Sandy Jones. The event will be chaired by Caroline Archer, co-director of the Centre for Printed History and Culture. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, a reminder that this event has been recorded. Um, as it is a public platform, please don't share any confidential information or, or anything that's private um, that in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, also, if you have any questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A box and we'll go through them towards the end of the presentations. Um, so with all that said, welcome everyone and um, over to you, Caroline. Thank you, Claire. And yeah. Yes, welcome everybody to this, which is the second Hoping event that comes under the banner of Illustrating Industry. The first event was run in March this year and featured three excellent talks on cigarette cards, the Colebrookdale Company catalogues and illustrated cookery books. If you missed the first session, don't worry, it's available online either through the CPHC website or the ArtsFest YouTube channel. I'm sure we can give you links at some point during the evening. But so popular was the theme illustrating industry, we decided to run today's second session. So on this occasion, we welcome Ruth Hibbard, Deborah Sutherland and Sandy Jones, who will be showcasing examples of 1930s industrial publishing from the V&A's jobbing printing collection. I think industrial publishing is often disregarded by academics because it doesn't have the same gravitas perhaps as book history or the same level of appeal as ephemera studies, um, chapbooks or cheap print. Industrial publishing falls somewhere between those two spheres and it's quite difficult to categorize, but it should be taken more seriously and the field certainly deserves scholarly attention. And there's plenty of material out there to occupy our attention. I think industrial publishing is a vast area with a significant net worth and virtually every company that operates in the commercial world has industrial publishing as a subsidiary activity to its main business. Any organization that's ever issued a catalog or produced an advertising leaflet, circulated an annual report and accounts or published an in-house magazine or even today launched a website may class itself as a publisher of industrial literature. And amongst the run of the mill outputs, there are, of course, a number of organizations that have taken the production of their literature very seriously and have produced material of extraordinary quality and appeal. In the 1930s, which was a real heyday for the genre, leading exponents included organizations, of course, like London Transport, the BBC, ICI and Shell big companies not only with big budgets but with the vision to understand the role of printing and the advancement of industry and that well-designed well-illustrated material could do much to progress their work particularly when produced by leading uh, printers such as the Kerwin Press in London, Percy Lund Humphreys in Bradford or the Kynock Press in Birmingham. So this evening Ruth Sandy and Deborah will use examples from the VNA National Arts Library Jobbing Printing Collection to highlight how this compilation of graphic design from the 1930s reflects innovations in commerce and industry at the time. Just to say, Ruth is curator in the Department of Art, Architecture, Photography and Design at the VNA. Deborah has been a librarian at the VNA for over 20 years. And Sandy is a volunteer researcher at the NLA with a special interest in the jobbing printing collection. And since, the, and since 2015, they've worked together on this collection. So over to Ruth, Deborah and Sandy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, we're going to just briefly introduce ourselves um, so that you know which face belongs to whom. Um, oh, except you can't see my face. <laughs> My name's Deborah Sutherland, and as Caroline said, I'm um, a librarian in the National Art Library at the VNA. Um, Ruth? So I'm Ruth Hibbard, and uh, I'm a curator in the AAPD, which is Art, Architecture, Photography, and Design Department at the VNA. Okay. 
Hi, and I'm Sandy Jones. I'm a volunteer design history researcher at the National Art Library with a particular focus on the Jan Chickold purchase, which was the only collection purchased for jobbing printing by Philip James. Picturing a modern world, the jobbing printing collection as a reflection of innovation in industry and commerce in the 1930s. Um, what we are hoping to do is just give you a very general introduction to the collection, and then we're each going to give um, three brief case studies. Um, which will focus on innovation and industry and commerce in the 1930s. So uh, for those of you who don't already know, the Jobbing Printing Collection is a collection of about 6,000 items of ephemera held in the National Art Library at the V&A. Um, we feel it offers a fascinating snapshot of early 20th century printing and commercial art. The collection was developed between 1936 and early 1940, the period, the 1930s period that Caroline referred to, when Philip James, who was deputy and then keeper at the National Art Library, requested samples of work from high profile companies and designers across Britain, Europe and North America. His intention was to create an open reference collection of commercial typography. So next slide, please, Ruth. Um, he the collection was brought into the National Art Library, brought into the National Art Library, work that captured a complex and exciting moment in the evolution of commercial art in Britain. At the time, the world was recovering from a period of economic depression. Britain was rebuilding its economy by spending on large scale social initiatives and encouraging the general population to purchase more mass produced goods. Construction companies were building new homes using new materials and technologies and cheap credit encouraged families to buy innovative domestic goods and then make use of newly available leisure with radio, television, travel, and for those who could afford it, cars. The role of good design in the provision of essential services and in manufacturing well-made manufacturing well -made affordable goods was reassessed. Um, our museum, the VNA, actively contributed to debates about art and industry collaborating with emerging organizations like the Design and Industries Association and the Council for Art and Industry. There was also a growing recognition of the important role that the commercial art played, not only in promoting consumption and thus stimulating the economy, but also in influencing consumer taste. Um, I'm not going to speak to each of the images on the slide. We're just trying to show you um, what jobbing printing, what, what there is in jobbing printing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, James really believed um, in all of these um, ideals, and he cited not only the example of companies and corporate bodle, bodies like the General Post Office and London Transport that Caroline's also just referred to, but also the role that advertising the luxury trades played an increasing awareness of what constituted good quality or good value. To fulfill his intention to showcase exemplary design, commercial typography and new printing techniques from across the world, um, he identified and contacted more than 100 companies, agencies, designers, and art schools. Uh, these images show um, work that was sent in by individual designers, such as ha um, Ashley Havenden, Henry Ellis from um, Germany, um, Herbert Matter, Herbert Bayer, Alistair Morrison, and uh, Morris Beck. Fine artists were increasingly commissioned to produce commercial art that was engaging and full of visual interest for the consumer. And the collection contains some excellent illustrative work. Again, we've highlighted um, work from um, Borden, Whistler, um, Fugas, um, Zemeli in Italy and um, Dufy. Other donors included the organizations and companies that commissioned the work. Um, in her case study, Sandy explores in more detail the influential people committed to introducing uh, the modernist aesthetic to British design, but um, there were also companies um, that created the work, like advertising agencies, such as the French printing house, Draga Frere, um, which is credited with starting the first communication or advertising agency in 1920, or Crawford's, which was um, the agency that Havenden worked for. Um, and also printers and type foundries, such as Aurel Fusli or Bauer, um, or any of the presses that Caroline just mentioned. <laughs> um, the material received from these companies reveal the close link between developments in printing and, in, and innovative commercial art. Next slide, please. Um, although the jobs presented um, here that we're going to show you today um, are all finished pieces. It should also be noted that James wanted the library to provide students with handling examples of different stages in the, pro in the printing process. 
So uh, the jobbing printing collection includes um, such things as hand draw lettering, proofs, incomplete layouts, blads, and brochures bound in a, in a huge variety of ways. Um, the collection demonstrates the range of what was possible with printing at the time, particularly technologies which allowed designers a greater freedom in the use of color due to developments in papers and inks. Um, plastics as a material, uh, there's a fair amount of um, pieces in the collection that actually have polythene covers or use plastic in an interesting way. And Ruth will actually talk about one of those later in her case study. Spiral binding, um, original and varied fonts and innovative photographic te techniques like photomontage. Much of what was sent to the library reflected progressive developments in photography and architecture in its um, aesthetic. So where dynamic simplicity was valued over detail, form preferred over ornament, and where typography was used as an illustrative element. A small exhibition of modern commercial typography was held in the V&A's book gallery to publicize the new collection. Distinctive pieces of current but traditional work were displayed alongside those that showed the influence of movements such as constructivism, surrealism and vorticism and other avant-garde movements. And that's what we've tried to um, demonstrate on this slide. In the following case studies, we aim to show how these developments and trends in printing and commercial art reflected equally pioneering design in industry, services, and everyday objects. I'm going to hand over to Ruth now. You're mute again, Ruth. <laughs> Um, as Deborah has set the context uh, for the 1930s, this was um, uh, a time of great uh, change um, of both. Sorry, uh, Ruth, the, um, the presentation has just come out of oh. the, um, the slideshow. Uh, okay, is that better? Yes, it is. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, it's just when I had to unmute myself. Um, Okay, so uh, as Deborah has put the context of the 1930s, uh, this was a time of great social change, um, partly as a response to the financial insecurity of the early 1930s. And there was an impetus to improve the economy and create a more modern world. Um, this involved government sponsored initiatives intended to create work, encourage investment and transform society um, and into a more improved place to live. Both industry and commerce were both fundamental elements of this strategy, and the job imprinting collection can be used to explore aspects of this um, in different ways, as you'll see. Um, among the initiatives intended to reinvigorate society in the 1930s were schemes to improve housing, um, which obviously involved a lot of industrial um, companies in this initiative. In the 1930 Housing Act, uh, there was the, it was endorsed that the demolition of poor quality slum housing could, be, could occur, um, replacing the old neglected overcrowded housing by newer, more modern houses with improved water supply, power, ventilation and light. This led to a boom in the building industry not seen before or since as companies used cheap credit with low interest rates to buy land and materials to buy new homes. These new homes could be supplemented with new comforts, both practical with new facilities in bathrooms and kitchens, and also entertaining with radio, televisions, and even cars bought by consumers on the same cheap credit. The jobbing printing collection manifests these trends and also demonstrates and documents how innovative and imaginative commercial design was used to publicize these um, to society. There was fierce competition between building and construction companies who used promotional material to boost their visibility. These materials in themselves um, were often not new, um, such as ink uh, we have here, um, but were showing their relevance to the modern methods of building. This booklet, which is aimed at architects and builders, promotes the use of zinc. And this is probably possibly my favourite item in the whole collection, as Deborah and Sandy will a test. Um, the cover is strikingly modern in its minimal design, featuring a photographic image superimposed on a bold blue background with a scientific symbol for zinc, the only text. The booklet contains a sample of zinc, which you can see 
on the second image, bound in using the latest innovative spiral binding. Zinc was used in building, um, as you can see on the front cover with our chap there, um, but also in the expanding automobile and appliance industries that were flourishing in the 1930s. Um, in the UK, hundreds of thousands of houses were built, cities expanded into the suburbs, and many people became homeowners rather than renters. House building was concerned with quality as well as quantity, with more modern, comfortable, better housing becoming the aspiration of companies building them as well as people buying them. Um, this booklet from the British Steelworkers Association promotes steel as a building material for better homes. Um, the metallic printed cover, and I don't know how well you can see um, on this slide, uh, but there's quite a lot of metallic printing. Um, all the silver colours are metallic, and I think the red around the windows is also, um, uh, and it really catches the eye when you see it in real life. Um, so this shows an architectural plan for an apartment with steel components marked in red. More resilient to vermin than wood, this included the skirting boards, picture rails, doors and window frames. So this was a, um, seen as an improvement um, towards more um, hygienic housing. Um, the image shows a flat rather than a house, um, while uh, in the UK the building of houses um, dominated, such as the mock Tudor semis that flooded the suburbs. Modern streamlined light and airy flats following the European model were becoming increasingly common, particularly in inner cities. And you can see um, from the open page that we have here that this booklet relates to a demonstration flat that was um, put together by the British Steelworkers Association to uh, give a real life um, uh, experience that you could walk in and, and compare it to your own home and see how better it is. Um, so this is um, have got various different innovative ways to showcase um, their product. Uh, the British Electrical Development Association linked itself to the house building boom, uh, and this booklet here, Rehousing with the Aid of Electricity, was published in 1934 and was aimed at town planners. The architectural blueprint plan cover opens to an image of a clean, new, modern flat contrasted with dilapidated old housing. You can see the upper smaller image. Um, gas heating and power held a virtual monopoly on domestic power in England until the formation of the national grid following the Electrical Supply Act of 1926, which enabled many more homes to be connected to the electricity supply. Electricity represented itself as a modern fuel and modernist aesthetics and ideals are visible in its campaign. Um, the cover resembles a 3D architectural plan, an architecture such as flats um, and uh, like modernist buildings like the Delaware Pavilion at Bexhill were a significant way that modernism was introduced to England. And modernist ideas such as efficiency and cleanliness were used to encourage the use of electricity as power for lighting, heating and domestic goods in your houses. And you can see the lower image there has cleanliness of electricity as their um, header in that image. Um, unhygienic older housing stock were replaced with modern cleaner homes which contained more amenities such as better kitchens and bathrooms. This booklet for copper tubing has a modern look. The cover, again, with a metallic covered card, um, with simple lettering, is cleverly designed to look like tubes. The inside explains the benefits of copper tubing to create a modern house with improved sanitary facilities, so for really hot bath water and really pure drinking water. It's the idea of comfort and cleanliness uh, and efficiency that are these modern ideals. Um, interestingly, the company diversified its offer by including other uses for copper, Copper tubing for minimalist furniture, you can see on the uh, smaller lower image, um, increased their modernist credentials. The buying of new mass marketed consumer goods was encouraged to boost spending and invigorate the economy. 
indoor entertainment such as radios as well as kitchen goods such as fridges increasingly filled people's homes and we have little selection of um, domestic goods um, uh, um, ephemera here. Uh, the, the bright leaflet for Telefunken, uh, which is a kind of record player radio, with a photographic image of the girl against a bright red background, shows how much fun you can have with this music system um, and entertaining at home rather than going out to the old fashioned music hall or um, uh, dance halls. Um, and leaflets such as domestic, for domestic goods, such as washing machines, including this surreal one by Max Bill, that looks a bit more like a weird robot, um, and the more traditionally illustrated one for the, um, uh, the refrigerator with the Mr. Firm character created by Eric Fraser. Both promoted the vision of a more efficient household that would save time and money by investing in labour-saving devices. Um, and the text may be too small to tell, but on the gas refrigerator, there is a, um, a bit about uh, buying this product on credit. So again, this um, uh, use of cheap credit to be reinvigorate the buying and, and the uh, rebuilding of the economy. Aspirational modern households could also own a car. Increased manufacturing and cheap credit again, brought cars within the reach of middle-class families. The growth of car manufacturing moved the geographical center of industry from the coal fields of the north to the new mechanical industries of the Midlands and South. Uh, the dropping printing collection has lots of interior advertising cars. Uh, it's a glamorous but affordable luxury. And we have a couple here of um, the Mercedes um, uh, leaflets. Uh, the building boom of the 1930s included road building, which stretched out into the suburbs and increasingly connected towns and cities. Three Weeks, which is the um, booklet on the uh, far side of the slide, uh, reacted to this desire to quickly increase the road network by promoting rapid hardening cement. Um, the clever use of red plastic um, on the cover, so the image with that just has three weeks is the cover and it opens um, to reveal um, underneath the the date with three weeks written on it if that makes sense um, it's an attention grabbing device um, seen on quite a few job in printing objects uh, as deborah refer referred to earlier um, and innovations within plastic production for things like cellulose allowed um, elements like plastic to be incorporated into ephemeral booklets um, Shell Mex uh, was one of the companies that created imaginative promotional material to go alongside the idea of car ownership, um, making it more of a fun activity and um, uh, suggesting ideas for day trips. And this booklet here, Times Chains, um, is one of those that featured uh, um, uh, recognized artists and this time's change features the work of McKnight Kaufer, which links to Sandy, who is next. Thank you, Ruth. Shall I go to your slide, Sandy? Yes, please. Next slide, yes. please. Okay. So having Consider jobbing printing in the context of innovation in commerce and industry. I'll now shine a light on a designer represented in the collection. Edward McKnight Kaufer is viewed as one of the most influential commercial artists of the early 20th century in England. He is best known for the poster art he designed for London, London Underground, yet he was also an artist and designed interiors, exhibitions and textiles. At the vanguard of his field, he worked with the most progressive industries, advertising agencies and printers of the interwar period. Kaufer was born in Great Falls, Montana in 1890 and in 1810 moved to San Francisco where he worked in Paul Elder's bookstore and attended the California School of Design in the evenings. There he met Joseph McKnight, a professor from Utah University who offered to sponsor him in 1912. As a gesture of gratitude, Kaufer took his name, McKnight, as his middle name. Kaufer then briefly studied at the Art Institute of Chicago, 
where he visited the Armory Show in 1913. The exhibition, which had travelled from New York, opened Cowper's eyes to the radical art of the European avant-garde, such as Van Gogh, Picasso, Matisse and Duchamp. The show provoked widespread media attention and controversy and is viewed today as a transformative moment in the history of modernism in American art. Kaufer soon travelled to Europe, where in Munich he was inspired by the street posters of Ludwig Holwein, a pioneer of placat steel, a poster style characterised by bold typography, a simple central image and a vivid colour palette. Arriving in Paris in the autumn of 1913, he briefly studied at the Académie Moderne before relocating to England at the start of World War I with his first wife, American pianist Grace Ehrlich. A turning point in his career came in 1915 when Frank Pick, visionary publicity manager of the London Underground Electric Railways, Railways, commissioned him to design two landscape posters. As you can see on the slide, both Oxy Woods and in Watford evidence the influence of post-impressionism. More commissions followed and his new posters became so eagerly anticipated that a public notice appeared prior to installation with the words, a new McKnight Kaufer poster will appear here shortly. Summing up Kaufer's appeal in 1937, John Betjeman wrote, Mr. Edward McKnight Kaufer urged as the chief discoverer and perpetrator of a technique of poster design calculated to, calculated to strike the eye at a distance, intrigue, slightly shock, and yet never to offend. Next slide, please, Ruth. Pick was amongst a group of commercial patrons who provided essential employment for artists and helped to propel modern art into the public, public consciousness. This group, dubbed the New Medici in 1934 by Cyril Connolly in Architectural Review, included Jack Beddington, publicity manager at Shell Mex, William Crawford from WS Crawford Advertising Agency, and Stephen Talents, public relations officer at the General Post Office. Kaufer worked with all of these organisations to produce their publicity material, including the five colour leaflets shown far right on the slide, designed for the 1938 exhibition of pictures in advertising, commissioned by Shell Max and BP. Progressive printers also played a pivotal role in shaping the development of commercial art, and Kaufer worked with, and it's the roll call that Caroline uh, mentioned earlier, Lund Humphreys, Cohen Press, Baynard Press, and another one, Vincent Brooks, Day and Son. The leaflets on this slide were printed by Lund Humphreys and show how his experiments with colour, illustration, graphic elements and photomontage were brought to life in, in printed form. Using techniques such as airbrushing, he was able to achieve variations in tone and add a machine aesthetic to his typography. Lund Humphreys appointed Kaufer as their first design director and he designed the middle leaflet with the key, with the key graphic, to announce the printer's move to Bedford Square in Bloomsbury and the opening of their new exhibition space in 1932. In this gallery, the work of modern artists and designers such as Man Ray, Hans Schlager and Jan Chickold was promoted. Next slide, please, Ruth. This slide shows how Kaufer drew on a range of influences to get his message across. The London issue cover for Gebrauch's graphic from 1937 on the left depicted a surrealist inspired Buckingham Palace supporting the editorial inside that proposed, quote, the most astonishing thing about London is how it manages to find the synthesis between the still existing past and the progressive future, end quote. The cover for packaging design journal Shelf Appeal from 1934 shows the influence of cubism and constructivism aligned with its progressive agenda to educate designers in the use of new techniques and materials. The Outposts of Britain campaign for the GPO in 1937 brought graphic modernism into the classrooms of over 28,000 schools. The flat colour background and three-dimensional framed photograph combined to create a powerfully modern layout with depth and perspective. This campaign was produced in a range of sizes, including large posters, a format not collected by James for jobbing printing. For the New Orient line, 
Kalfa dra draws on the ancient instruments of navigation and sailing to communicate the romance of travel, elegantly integrating graphics and typography and using metallic inks to denote first class. That's the one on the left. Commenting on Kalfa's ability to capture the zeitgeist, L. Fritz Gruber, editor of Gruber's Graphic, commented, he sits meditatively among antiques and super realistic work, a man of tomorrow. Next slide, please, Ruth. During the 1930s, Fortnum and Mason commissioned H. Stuart Menzies, governing director of the Stuart Advertising Agency, to create their publicity material. Unified by a gentle wit and eclectic style, the material produced reflected the diverse range of artists and designers employed by the agency, including Edward Borden, Rex Whistler, Cecil Beaton, Oliver Messel and Kathleen Hale. And we have a number of, um, of jobbing printing examples from Fortnum and Mason in the collection. Writing in art and industry, Malcolm Mackenzie acknowledged the store's commitment to its past and future. He said, Fortnum and Mason have marched in step with the times. The past has not been set aside ruthlessly, but graciously exploited in such a manner that every innovation so soon becomes a part of the firm's progress. Kaufer's leaflet announced the launch of a range of women's ready-to-wear sportswear. Its dramatic min minimalist cover challenged the typical feminine tropes of the period, perhaps reflecting his public denouncement in the early 1920s of pretty advertising. Instead, the design's focus is on the four numbers on a tape measure, that's on the, on the front cover, to explain the range was available in four different sizes. Next slide, please, Ruth. In contrast, the inside page illustrations not by Kaufer are more consistent with the style of the period. They are not attributed to, to an artist, so if anyone recognises this style, we'd really love to hear from you. Whilst Kaufer found fame in England, he would never attain the same level of achievement in the US when he and his second wife, textile designer Marion Dawn, returned in 1940. For those wanting to learn more, the Cooper Hewitt's new exhibition, Underground Monist, Modernist, is the largest ever retrospective on his career, and it's on now until April 2022. There's an excellent book to accompany the exhibition, which includes some of the works from Jobbing Printing. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Sandy. Thank you. Um, Ruth, the next slide. Um, so, um, McKnight Kalfa returned to New York City, but as Sandy has noted, his short stay in Chicago in 1913 had influenced his work quite significantly. And it's Chicago that is associated with some of um, the more interesting and particularly for a British collection of ephemera, more uncommon print jobs from the United States. Um, as we explained in the introduction, James formed the collection by approaching people and companies he considered to be making excellent, innovative and inspiring work. We haven't yet quite discovered a tangible link between James and the new Medici that Sandy referred to, um, but we do know that Jan Chickold visited the exhibition of modern commercial typography in the book gallery at the V&A and started corresponding with James, ultimately leading to a significant acquisition of his works for the JP collection. Um, and there were other contacts with Bauhaus designers, including Moli Nage, who moved to Chicago in 1937. Much of what we've discovered about the collection is based on letters sent and replies received, um, which are now all in the V&A archive and registry. And one of the letters we were especially excited to come across was this one on the slide from Moli Nage, where he apologizes for not meeting with James when he was last in London. And as an explanation, encloses the brochure that's on the left for the new Bauhaus, which he started in Chicago. Published by the Lakeside Press and printed, unsurprisingly, by R.R. Donnelly and Sons. Um, he goes on in the letter to draw James' attention to the American Institute of Graphic Arts exhibition, arranged by William Kittredge, Director of Design and Typography at Donnelly. Next slide, please, Ruth. Um, James followed Molinar's advice and received about 20 small jobs from Kittredge, showcasing Donnelly. Um, Kittredge explained that there was no catalogue printed for the 1937 AIG exhibition, although he did enclose the invitation um, that they had printed. Uh, I haven't included it here because it's purely typographic 
and we felt that today's focus was on illustrated ephemera, but it should be noted that the exhibition was titled Printing for Commerce. One of the methods that Donnelly promoted itself was in exhibitions. Um, they held them in the Lakeside Press Gallery, so the publishing part of Donnelly was called Lakeside Press. Um, not only the annual AIGA exhibitions, but also uh, you can see two um, invitations here to the annual advertising art exhibition, um, then various exhibitions about for the layperson about printing and binding, exhibitions that um, showcased works of art quite often related to the Art Institute of Chicago, and even um, serendipitously and quite weirdly at exactly the same time as James was putting on the Modern Commercial Typography Exhibition, which was November 1936 to March 1937, Donnelly was showing an exhibition of little things, um, possibly the most significant exhibition that they put on in this particular period was the exhibition of international fine printing, uh, the, which image in the top right corner. Um, seemingly, although Donnelly had a stand at the Century of Progress Exposition, which is otherwise known as the Chicago World's Fair, um, despite, of course, printing the stunning official souvenir catalog, um, their suggestion for showing um, the world's work in fine printing, they wanted to do a stand that just did that, um, was actually rejected. So what they did then was um, create one of their own in the Lakeside Gallery um, with the added bonus of inviting people who came to go up onto the roof and view the lights of the fair from afar. I have intimated um, already twice that Donnelly printing the new Bauhaus announcement and the World's Fair catalog was only to be expected. And this is because their business was wide ranging I'm not going to say much about the history of the company. Um, as far as I can ascertain, there isn't actually a monograph about it. But in 2005, the um, archive was donated to the University of Chicago, and there is an online digitized copy of the catalog of that exhibition that was held to celebrate the gift. Um, it provides all the essential facts, and I really recommend it. Um, I would, however, like to quote from the introduction. R.R. R. Donnelly & Sons Company, a Chicago-based firm that has become the largest provider of print and print-related products and services in the world. And this is, this is a true claim um, when you go onto the website that now exists. Um, the cumulative impact of R.R. R. Donnelly on modern American life has been remarkable. In nearly every aspect of home or business life, Americans have encountered R.R. R. Donnelly printed products. Montgomery Wards or Sears Roebuck mail order catalogs, uh, the first city telephone directories, magazines like Time or Life or Business Week or National Geographic, um, best-selling books from trade publishers such as Random House and Penguin, sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica, promotional circulars in local newspapers and direct mail advertising and financial documents and corporate publications. Um, next slide, please, Ruth. One of the reasons behind the company's success was a commitment to craftsmanship and innovation at every stage of the printing and binding process, particularly in the period that we, we're looking at today. Um, Thomas Elliott was uh, the head of the company at the time. He inherited the business from his brother, Reuben H. Donnelly, and encouraged, excuse me, and encouraged and encouraged an entrepreneurial spirit in all of his managers, who were people like William Kittredge. In 1932, the company patent, patented a lithographic half-tone etching method that ut utilized a sensitized photographic plate. Um, this was called, this what led to the deep tone process, which enabled coated papers to be printed with finer screens and um, that led to better tonal values and reproductions much closer in color to the, to the original, um, particularly in large format illustrations and photographs. Uh, the four brochures we see here focus on different ways that um, improvements to deep tone, which were made in 1935, could be used to provide even better reproductions. Um, so the four are a four color process for oil paintings, which the brochure claims give an exactness of color um, that a short time ago would have only been possible with the use of eight or nine colors. Um, color prints, um, and in this case, um, one of uh, Redute's roses, which was related to another exhibition that they did. Um, a Russell Flint watercolor um, that they point out retains its warmth of tone because of deep tone. And Kodachrome color snapshots, which can be produced not just on enameled paper, but also on antique paper. Um, at the same time in 1935, when uh, publisher Henry R. Luce wanted to inaugurate a glossy weekly picture magazine to be called Life, Donnelly developed a method to dry ink on um, machine coated paper by means other than absorption. 
the breakthrough came with a new process called heat set printing, um, when company engineers introduced um, a heater to contain and control a flame directed over the web fed paper as it passed through the press presses at high speed. And um, this is supposed um, has been um, shown to uh, that it, it, that's what led to life being such a success because it was a color magazine that could do that um, thanks to Donnelly's printing um, innovations. Uh, slide four, please. Next slide. Another reason the company flourished and is today a leading global provider of multi-channel business communication services and marketing solutions, I'm quoting their website, um, was an aim articulated by its founder, Richard Robert Donnelly, to provide what he called undivided responsibility. In the early 1900s, that meant lith lithographers, map makers, engravers, binders, and every piece of equipment required in the process of publishing and printing. As printing and publishing changed and developed, the company continued to offer its customers a service that provided for every stage of any piece of printing, jobbing or otherwise, always with an emphasis on new and improved production, as the brochures on this slide indicate. Um, I've shown you just a very small sample of the material that Kittredge sent, um, but like the jobbing printing collection, um, we believe it provides a snapshot, excuse the pun, of a very specific but very innovative and commercially successful period. Um, last slide. As we have indicated in these brief case studies, the jobbing printing collection was not intended to be an exhaustive record of the organizations and designers represented. However, there is enough breadth and depth to throw light on many aspects of design and social history of the time. Our three case studies show, we hope, how the ephemeral items can be used to support researching different aspects of manufacturing and industrial design of commercial art and printing technology. And we encourage anyone who's interested in this period or any of the themes that we've mentioned to contact the National Art Library and consult the collection. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you, all three of you, for a, a beautiful presentation. Um, it's it's great to see the collection and to know the collection is there. And printers are notoriously bad at keeping archives. Um, it's just work to many of them, and they don't really realise the significance of what they're producing, of course, until after the event. So to have this intense collection there of a, of a very specific period of time is great. I remember from my own research having to shoot from one library to another library, trying to track down individual copies of things to try and piece together a, a profile for the Kynot Press. Um, so. Are there any questions out there? I know we've got one question from Claire, which is um, asking about how the collection has already been used by researchers. What sort of things have they been doing? Shall I answer that? Um, chip in for other, <laughs> the rest of you if you want. So, uh, well, you used it <laughs> for your book and it has been used in that way. Um, um, uh, the person who, whose name I've just forgotten, who wrote about Ashley Havenden has used it. So people who are writing books, the museum itself hasn't used it quite as, or didn't use it quite as much as you would have expected because um, the war happened <laughs> immediately after James started to collect and um, everything got packed away in boxes and put into a room safely. But unfortunately they weren't unpacked for um, gosh, about 30 years. Um, so in the 80s is when Robin Kinross, that's who I was thinking of, um, um, came and um, he, he was friends with, um, or yeah, he knew um, the person who, was, who looked after uh, the library's pictorial collections. And um, so he knew about it in that way. Um, occasional pieces have gone on show, but it wasn't really until, um, was it 2015, Ruth? when um, the library did uh, made an exhibition and a book um, promoting itself <laughs> um, that traveled to Australia. And we were asked to uh, write a chapter about jobbing printing. And that's where we discovered all the letters. And we have, we, it's been our mission since then, basically, to just tell everybody and anybody about it. So it's been used in a small display. It was obviously used um, in the big display that went to Australia. It's been used in a small display at the V&A. And um, since then, 
um, because we talk about so much within the museum, um, pieces have been in some of the V&A's exhibitions like liners and cars, and we never seem to miss an opportunity to persuade somebody to take it, which is why also the, uh, we mentioned the Cooper Hewitt McKnight Carfer exhibition. So it's had chapters in books and it's had exhibitions and it's had articles. We did an article for the Ephemerist. Um, what we would love to do one day is to do a whole book about it. <laughs> yeah, I was about that. My, so what you felt you wanted to do with it, what research mm. potential you could see in the archive I've, also close to it. Yeah, I've, I've missed out Sandy's research, which is very important. Sandy, tell us what you've been doing. Well, I've been looking at the Jan Chicol purchase. So as I mentioned earlier, that was the only collection within the collection that was actually purchased, you know, with money from the from the museum, um, which was a very unusual purchase at the time because the museum wasn't collecting um, modern um, items. And this this um, collection from Jan Chicol had very um, a very strong aesthetic a lot a lot from germany a lot from um continent well, continental europe germany also from the us also from poland um and it, it's it's a very significant collection um for the for the library and also we've discovered since then as part of the research that chickold also sold collections to other organizations such as moma and uh, the basel kunst uh, Verba Museum as well so there are all these little satellite collections that he sold and we're in the process of trying to sort of connect those together which mm -hmm. is um, a fascinating endeavour and also just to add to what Deborah was saying earlier um, there was an exhibition at the oh, Verba yes. Brilliant, um, which was actually where we met mm -hmm. um, when I was doing some of the research at the Delaware and that exhibition focused on uh, specific items from jobbing printing so mm -hmm. uh, that was in 2016, 17, I think, mm. is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We've got a number of questions popping up in the chat now. So okay. if I, I'll take them from the top. The first one's from John Hinks. And John's asking, is the collection on open access at the NLA? Or do you have to request specific items in advance? Also, how much of the collection is online? <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, one of the reasons that we've done a lot of the um, the small articles and the exhibitions means that as part of the way the V&A works, um, it means that the items end up online. So it's it's actually very few, um, you know, in, in light of the fact that there are 6,000. But every time we do an article, if it gets photographed, we can then catalogue it. And so you can go on to um, explore the collections, um, which is the the V&A's um, digitized collections um, database. And um, if you put in jobbing printing, you will find, um, yeah, the most of the items that, and uh, very obviously they're the better items. They're the ones that we are, are most excited about. Um, but to answer the first part of your question, yes, very definitely. Um, anybody, well, not in the current climate, <laughs> but in usual circumstances when we aren't all suffering a pandemic, um, anybody can go along to the National Art Library and they, um, because it hasn't been fully catalogued, it's um, one of the reasons we got so friendly with Sandy because we're hoping that she might help us to do a bit more of that. Um, the significant pieces have, have catalog records. And again, you could just do a job in printing search on the National Art Library catalog, but you can also request boxes um, so you could get a whole box and then just sift through it. So it's um, it's part way there, um, but it, there's still a little way to go. But yes, definitely anybody can come and have a look at it. Okay, thank you. So I have a question here from Emma West. Um, she says, thank you for such a fascinating series of presentations. A linked question to John's previous question. Could you say something about James's intentions for the collection? Was it intended as a pedagogical tool for students or members of the public to learn about good design? Or do you think it was more simply a record of what was being produced at the time? It was very definitely pedagogical. That was absolutely his intention. Um, it's part of the uh, DNA of the V&A that um, to sort of do that. I mean, every 
we we go in waves and sometimes we do it better than other times but definitely in that period um the intention was to give students um something to look at that would inspire them, that would show them what was happening in the rest of the world. And um, that would also, as I said, um, show you the whole process. So that's why there are pieces that are um, just hand-drawn designs, and then you can actually sort of see the whole printing process from beginning to end. That was his intention, but as I say, um, it all stopped with the Second World War. So um, that's why, I mean, it's wonderful to us looking in hindsight that it's, it's such a neat, um, or, yeah, almost neat, um, snapshot of what was happening and, and a lot was happening as we've already acknowledged. But um, yeah, it, I think he really, really hoped that it would become something that uh, was continually added to and showed um, printing and commercial art developing. Um, yeah. How many, do you know off the top of your head, how many <laughs> artists and how many printers are represented in the collection? Sandy might, because she's very kindly sat down with a spreadsheet and looked at it all. <laughs> I have. I'd have to, I'll have to get back to you on that one, um, Caroline. I can't, I can't actually give you the figure off the top of my head. It's been a mm. while since I've, I've been into that mm. spreadsheet, but um, could definitely give you that, give you an estimate um, of that. Mm. Uh, interesting, because, you know, it strikes me the collection having so much in one place allows for a comparative mm. in a way that you you can't do normally yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and you'd be able to ha perhaps detect waves going through the industry waves of styles he was copying who who came in as a modernist first mm. who followed up behind them um you know for me that would be a really interesting um mm. research project to do yes. with <laughs> yeah um, yeah, you can very definitely see it amongst typefaces with printers, you know, those taking the lead, those that hang on to the coattails of others. Mm. Uh, so it would be really fascinating to have such a, an intensity mm. together and over a comparatively controllable short space of time as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A couple of more comments coming up in the um, chat. One, a, a comment from Sarah Johnson. How could we get more interest in local jobbing printing as they are in nearly every town in the USA? You know, how can we how can we raise people's awareness of the importance mm. of jobbing printing? She says, I'm fascinated by the work of jobbing printers in the 19th century um, as it relates to mail order catalogues and ephemera. Right. Oh, well. I don't know if there's a, a comparable collection in the US. So. Um, yeah, there, um, oh, you see, I immediately start thinking of trade literature, but I think the Hagley um, would probably have, because their collections are very much focused on advertising. Um, in terms of trade literature and ephemera, um, the I'm saying Wolverhampton because I've got the word in front of me. <laughs> oh, it also begins with a W. Uh, Winterter. Um, which is very near the Hagley, actually, um, is, uh, has a very good collection. And there's, um, in the Huntingdon, they've got interesting collections of ephemera, but not necessarily of jobbing printing. Um, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Oh, yes. And then there's yeah. the John Johnson collection at the Bowdoin. In Britain, yeah. In yeah. Britain, yeah. yeah. The, which you're probably aware of anyway, which is, has got some printed ephemera in it. Um, mm -hmm. A huge collection, actually. Yeah, that would be a rich source of jobbing printing, wouldn't it? Yeah. Historically, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I have here a question for Anita, again from John Hinks. Um, he says, can I ask Sandy to say a bit more about the outposts of Britain that she mentioned briefly? <laughs> yeah, so that was a, a campaign that uh, went to 28,000 schools and it was designed to um, com communicate the idea of the different places that the mail could travel to so it was a very you know it was promoting the innovation of the of the, of the gpo at the time that they could actually sort of get mail from all the different outposts of britain basically um and yes 20 over twenty eight thousand schools so all of those school children were exposed to that very strikingly modern uh campaign 
Thank you. Is there um, anything else to add, anyone? No. no. <laughs> There's a question here from Peter Crouch to Deborah. Thank you to you and your colleagues for very interesting presentations. Um, the number of references to printers from the US makes me think that my photographs of the hat show print display in Nashville may be relevant to your collection. Yes, thank you, Peter. I think they would provide an interesting background to, to our research. Um, I mean, we started off from zero <laughs> five years ago. Um, there's, there's not a lot of American material. Um, it's mostly American designers. Um, Donnelly kind of overshadows the whole um, of the printing thing. But I, but uh, yes, and I think it would provide interesting context. Thank you. And a question from Anita to all of you, I guess. Are there any plans to show some of the prints to the public in new exhibitions in the future? Shall I answer this one? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, as Deborah said earlier, we take any opportunity we can to promote our um, uh, the collection to anybody who might even be remotely interested. So, whenever a new um, exhibition idea comes up at the V&A, we dig around to see what we've got. So, for the cars exhibition, we dig out loads of cars related things. Um, some of the Orion material that was in Sandy's talk was in the Ocean Liner show. Um, so we do try and promote it in exhibitions. We also had some in the uh, photography gallery looking at photo montage, um, but I think that's just come out now. I think they're rehanging that. Um, we have some going to uh, an exhibition that's curated by people in my department about plastics um, that Sandy has been working on, which goes out. Uh, it's somewhere in Europe and then it's on D next year. Uh, called Beyond Plastics, I think. Is that right, Sandy? Yeah, it's in. Um, it's going to start at uh, Vitra's Galleries in Germany, and then it will go to Dundee. Okay. Um, so yes, any we do try and get as much um, into any any exhibitions that we can think of. So um, yeah, keep your eye out for us. I think. I mean, our aspirations are to do a book, and if there was a book, we would try and persuade. Um, the way it works in the V&A is you start off with a small exhibition. So we've done a very small one in a small gallery. There's a middle size gallery that we could go into. Um, and we would then use that as a stepping stone to um, try and persuade the museum that this would be an amazing exhibition to have in one of the, say, for example, the Porter Gallery. That's the one on the left when you walk in, in the front entrance. I don't think we could ever go to the, something the size of Alice in Wonderland, but um, you never know. <laughs> Thank you for the the vote of confidence that we might even consider it. <laughs> I think it would make a stunning exhibition. I'll, I'll back you up. <laughs> um, comment here from uh, John Hinks. Comment for Sandy. She asked about the style in the Fortnum and Mason brochure. So John suggesting a good person to ask would be Jenny Gilbert. Um, oh, yes. Jenny Perfect supposed to be our fourth presenter tonight but had COVID so she she wasn't able to speak but I can pass I can introduce the the two of you to have a chat with Jenny about the Fortnum brochure she may have some ideas and thoughts on that that would be great thank you I guess I just sort of have a a thought and a reflection which is it would have been lovely if somebody else at different times had also had the perspicacity to put collections together you know that immediate post-war period when Britain's trying to rebuild itself or the period when we entered the EEC and Britain was suddenly having to realize it had competition out there and needed to produce brochures in multiple languages to cope with foreign competitors, just these little snapshots at socially and politically critical times in our, our history and how that is then reflected in the print that comes out. And what about the here and now? Is there any thoughts about perhaps doing a snapshot of material that's currently being produced? Can I just, sorry, Deborah. Um, uh, Obviously, the, the 
the museum, the Vienna Museum, as opposed to the library, also collects prints and has uh, a limited collection of ephemera. So there, there is um, some areas that were represented within the prints and drawings department. Uh, for example, um, there's quite a large collection of ephemera to do with um, AIDS awareness um, and uh, political um, uh, campaigns in the 80s and 90s, like we've got a lot of Greenpeace material and that sort of thing. So there are little bits in the rest of the museum's collection, um, but uh, it's it's kind of fortuitous rather than um, by design, I think. And do you ever get printers, design agencies approaching you and say, would you like to take our collection? I think that would go to the Archive of Art and Design. Is that, would, would you agree with me, Deborah? Yeah, no, we do. Um, I mean, we, the AAD, the Archive of Art and Design, um, doesn't have a huge amount of graphic material. Um, and the two collections that immediately spring to mind are Heels and Habitat, but that's because um, they also designed furniture. So there's a kind of parallel. They, we have the graphic design material, but also um, I think mostly it was taken on because of furniture and um, how, how that has a parallel with the museum's collections. Um, trying to just think of um, anybody else. No, I, I, I mean, I'm sure there is and we're just forgetting, but um, yeah, it's not, it's not um, a significant number though. Yeah. And the current collection, you mentioned you have 6,000 odd pieces. Is that 6,000 odd printed finished products plus the layouts and supplementary material or does that include the supplementary material? It's, it includes the supplementary material. It's, it's sort of 6,000 pieces of paper, so to speak, <laughs> or bound, some, some of them being bound pieces of paper, but yeah. yeah. And how's the collection organised? Um, it is at the moment, it's um, organised by uh, the people who gave it. So the companies or the designers. Um, it, at one point in its history, it was also organized um, according to the categories that James gave had, had in the um, initial exhibition, but so, some of that has been lost. Although we did recently, another recent find in the, in the museum's archives was um, a, a record of what that um, exhibition looked like. And that's something we have, that, that is an idea we've played with actually, is that possibly our next exhibition would be a sort of um, replication of that, but that maybe um, we, we could do what you've suggested, which is to do kind of like a, also a 21st century parallel one and just sort of show the two. But that's literally just a thought that we've had. <laughs> we haven't, I don't think I've even told my manager that, so. <laughs> Got one last question here, perhaps from Anita, who says, with today's technology, do you think that printing is still something important and valuable in modern life? That's a big question. You might be better answer, able to answer actually, Karen, <laughs> um, than, than us. <laughs> I think it is. I, I think, I, I mean, I, my, my real expertise is in trade literature and mail order catalogues. And um, one thing that I've absolutely noticed in the first 20 years of the 21st century is that we went, they went very, very digital and you would only get emails um, and promotional material that was digital. And um, just in the last, I'd say three to four years, um, all of those companies have now started producing print catalogues again. So yeah. yeah. I think it's the, the age old thing. One technology doesn't push another technology out. They all coexist. Um, we've got many people saying thank you very much for fantastic presentations. Um, Helena Wright saying thank you, wonderful talks. The graphic arts collection at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History has a collection from Donnelly received around the 1920s. 20s, 1960s, and we'd love to connect with the v &A about that. I'm guessing, Helena, you're at the Smithsonian? Um, yes, yeah, definitely. Thank you. 
both the uh, museum, its archive center, and the Smithsonian libraries have rich collections of ephemera and trade literature beyond what's in graphic arts. You can get started searching at collections.si.edu or americanhistory.si.edu. Happy to follow up um, Helena Wright, Curator Emerita. And she has given her email address, which we can pass on to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Anita Singh, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation and passionate answers. Which I think sums it, sums it up. Oh, hang on. There's one question popped up in the Q&A. Uh, uh, right. Peter Crouch again saying, I have a small collection of booklets and publicity material produced for international nickel in the 70s and 80s. Would the National Art Library be a good home for them? Um, contact me and we can discuss it. <laughs> we do have uh, some work related to nickel. Yeah. yeah. We have Nicoloid, don't we, Deborah, that we've yeah, used we do. for yeah. something. Yeah. So, yeah. If there are no other questions from anybody, I think it's just uh, up to me to say thank you very much to our three speakers for the great talks this evening, for the lovely imagery. And I think we're all incredibly tempted now to trot down to the VA and have a look at the material. So thank you. Thank I'll you. Back as well. Thanks so much, Caroline. Um, thank you to Ruth, Deborah, and Sandy for your wonderful presentations. It's so rich, isn't it, all this? Um, and, you know, I think we could just chat to you forever about it. Um, and of course, thank you, Caroline, as always, for chairing the session. Um, we will be back in the new year with a brand new programme of Hoping Talks. In the meantime, do join us for our next online event, which is tomorrow, Wednesday, the 24th of November at 2 p.m. Uh, it's with glass artist Naomi Jacks, and this is the next instalment of our Creative Futures series where artists, makers and designers share their insider knowledge on how to forge a creative career. Um, so as always, you can book for free through Eventbrite. Hope to see you there. Thanks for watching. Bye.